Carl Martell, thank you so much for being with us on Hemp Barons today. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Quite honored. You, oh, please. It's such a wonderful honor to have you here. You are one of these, not just a, a brilliant mind and, and personality, but just a face uh, that when I see you internationally um, as, we, as we travel along, and I think probably you and I, that's only been a, a North America situation, um, that just brings me so much joy. And, and I light up around folks who I know that the plant has absolutely picked on and chosen to do its bidding. You are a hemp master of epic proportions. Just you. your awareness. Oh, your awareness of, of the plant um, and all of the different aspects of it. And, and I'm, I'm excited to just get right into this interview because I'm going to start out Right away, uh, with all the things that you can do, the, the most amazing thing um, that I've seen so far in person in our interactions is Canadian Hemp Trade Alliance Conference, annual conference in Calgary. Uh, a couple of years ago, I, it wasn't even the most recent one. We, we got to commune with each other at the most recent one in November of 2019. God, was that really the most recent one? But it was. <laughs> but in November of 2018... Uh, you had what looked like uh, your basic hempcrete brick, looked like some herd, that inner woody core of the beautiful hemp stock, some some lime, some water, and I'm I'm oversimplifying it, but you're going to educate me and us here uh, with it with a wire sticking out of it. It was just literally like a hempcrete brick, a wire sticking out of it, and people were charging their tablets and their and their phones with what to me looked like a hempcrete brick. Here you are taking what is such a fascinating aspect of the plant, its energy storage capabilities um, and, and battery sort of capabilities and showing it to us in person, proving it. We're watching these devices be powered up and charged by uh, that invention of yours. Will you please explain to us a bit of what that was? Well, thank you very and why much it worked. Energy. And why it worked. And why it worked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think it, I think it's really great. I mean, I uh, started playing, I guess, with uh, these sort of materials, uh, whatever, 12 years ago or so, and, you know, building materials first and, and everything else. And um, geez, how did, how did I even start? I can't remember. I was like, yeah, I was mixing actually. How I came about it was I took uh, some lime which is a, one of the main ingredients in hempcrete, as, as people will know. Um, and then I combined that with a, a carbon, uh, basically a carbonized material. So, because I was trying to think to myself, okay, you know, can I improve upon uh, the hempcrete idea or can I make it, you know, flow a little bit better, or other things. And so I made one one day and then I set it aside. And for some reason, I came back to it and I, uh, I took uh, my, my voltmeter and touched it. And I said, oh, well, this is kind of interesting. I got to... I got a voltage on here, <laughs> you know, I was reading 1.2, I think, or something like that, 1.02, and uh, which isn't a whole lot. And it, at the time, too, it didn't really have that much in the way of uh, milliamps or anything like that. But it, it got me to thinking, and that's where it kind of I started rolling with the idea. I said, oh, wow, can I try, you know, can I store energy in hempcrete? And uh, so basically from that, uh, I started experimenting more and more and understanding more about batteries and uh, uh, these sort of things, and, and, and basically came to the understanding, you know, that uh, you know when you carbonize hemp uh, fiber, whether it be um, you know the fiber itself or the herd or other parts of the plant, you know, the shells, the, the leaf, um, they 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 could actually give you what is necessary in part of a battery, and that's the uh, you know old batteries. I'm going to try and make this as simple as possible. So if I take a, a regular double A battery. The, the metal casing that's around the outside is basically zinc, okay? And that's going to be your negative. And then right in the middle, there's actually a carbon rod, but it's actually made from uh, graphite. So we mine that from the ground. And then you have a paste that surrounds basically this carbon rod and touches basically the metal. And then you get that reaction. And then that's your, you know, your regular AA or AAA battery or D-cell battery. They're, they're all made basically the same way. And... Yeah, I started working with that and, and I came to that understanding. I said, okay, so there's carbon that we can get from the plant. Now, back in 2012, David Midland, um, so he, he actually did some experiments out in Calgary. Uh, he is now somewhere down in the States. I imagine, I think it was 
and he's either in Potsdam or maybe out in California. I can't remember. He's continuing to do that some of that work as well. He's I think he's doing these little uh, uh, CR twenty forty five batteries, the ones that go the little cell batteries, you know. Um, and, and, and so he did some experiments on the fiber itself, so the bass fiber. Okay, so that long fiber, and he you know found some. Um, this kind of a graphitized graphene type like material and uh, created small super capacitors, capacitors with them and, you know, came up with, uh, was able to measure capacitance and came up to about 140. And then, then in 2016, I think it was a paper I read by, uh, and way soon was another one. And he took basically the herd um, and he carbonized that uh, basically following the same principles as, as uh, David Mitla did uh, using a, a process called HTC, which is hydrothermal carbonization. So basically you take your plant matter. Uh, so I'm going to make this very really simple, right? So you take your plant matter, it goes into basically water, right? And then this in a stainless steel container and it's closed. And that's what they call an autoclave. So it doesn't matter. We just call it a stainless steel container. They close it up and then put it in the heat. Uh, and, you know, you cook it at 200 degrees Celsius for so many hours. And, you know, you have to add in a little bit of... Uh, something, some acid into that water. So kind of catalytic, catalyst action has happened and stuff like this and makes the pores bigger and stuff like that. So it works on the, on the graph, uh, on the material and then eventually turns it into carbon. You know, it's kind of a graphitized carbon. And then that material can then be used uh, to create your, um, your supercapacitor, the carbon that's necessary to supercapacitor. And you can be creating, you know, these dual carbon supercapacitors or you can have a, you know, a carbon and another kind of material, a copper, or zinc, or brass, you know, any, any number of things that you can experiment with that you can actually do just to have some kind of these potentials that are kind of going on. Uh, and, and so, you know, that then led me as well. I was doing some work and I was actually playing with the rice husks uh, or the, not the rice husk, I should say the, the husk of the, of hemp shell, uh, so people the can hull. kind of envision, yeah, the hull. So it's that's the outside shell of the hemp hearts that we eat, and that's usually a waster, and it's a byproduct of that process. So I took that and I started carbonizing that material. Uh, did the same thing too with the the leaves and uh, the other parts of the plant to to kind of experiment there as well and, and see that. And, and this this too all led to you know me really looking into like is it just hemp or can it be other things? And so I was looking into other plant materials like uh, bagasse, for example, right? So bagasse is the uh, the waste product from sugar cane. So it's like sugar cane fiber after it's been the juice has been pressed out of it. You get the sugar juice and you have this stuff called the gas. So it's just sugar cane waste. And, uh, you know, you take that and doing research and everything else and some, some of my own experiments and discover, wow, this stuff is even twice as good as the hemp. You're getting like 300 farads a gram uh, in, in, in the measurements. It was like, wow, that's pretty cool. And so on and so forth, you know. So looking at more... Uh, like I'm really focused on hemp. Okay. I, I work in the hemp industry. I have been for the last whatever, 12 years. Um, you know, I'm very focused there, but you know, some of the work that I'm doing with some of the co companies that I have and, and other companies, Abri, for example, which is advanced botanical and biomass research Institute, kind of expanding a little bit, you know, to, to, to kind of encompass more than just hemp because hemp in reality is still really small when we consider the, the, the global aspect of things. I mean, to put it in perspective, Canada, you know, we grew whatever, 100, 140,000 acres. It sounds like a lot. It's one of the largest in the world, you know, behind China and more than Europe and that sort of thing. So we're one of the biggest in the world in producing this stuff. And 95% of all cannabis grown in Canada is actually for food. You know, so people kind of Canada is the is the world leader in in bulk hemp food ingredients, and of course we we know and we talk all the time on the show about about infrastructure. Of course, uh, you know, and we're up to our saturated hemp and eyeballs here in the United States <laughs> on botanical extraction infrastructure. Oh, we've got botanical extraction infrastructure up the wazoo. Uh, having said that, and as you know, in Canada. It's the, the capital expenditures for the processing infrastructure for the longest, strongest stock in the world um, is, is a larger capex, right, than, uh, than to process the most nutrient-dense grain or seed in the world. Um, 
So, so indeed, uh, it's it's we're we're nowhere near acreage to to be able to feed all of the industries that we know that we can feed. We will get there with infrastructure. Right, but in time, one day. Yes, one day we we will get there. I uh, and I didn't mean to to interrupt you. Just uh, just wanted to 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 get the get the listeners um knowing uh, just sort of that that same reality, that same conundrum, or that same challenge slash simply the status of where we're at with the reemergence of that industries is this is this t- putting one foot in front of the other and making sure we're not asking farmers to grow a crop for which we don't have infrastructure and while begging the entrepreneurs to invest in infrastructure and waiting five years for their ROI so the crop can come up but anyway right. continue yeah so I mean the, the industry is growing and it's gro- growing exponentially I mean things are changing very rapidly I mean just look in the last 10 years or even just last two years I mean Canada is now allowing you know the uh, recreational use of, of, of cannabis and that's a that's a big change from where it was you know 20 years ago and you know things are things are getting better all the time in this industry and, and not just Canada I mean you look at the United States and you look worldwide how many jurisdictions are actually you know changing their stance in regards to this. it's just changed the UN they've unscheduled uh, cannabis as a narcotic you know so on and so forth I mean there's a lot of change happening and these are all catalysts to help you know propel this plant that you know when we think to, you know 150 200 years ago cannabis was the largest agriculturally traded crop in the world i mean that was it more than corn more than anything else i mean it, the british empire could have existed without without hemp we couldn't cannabis. we no. the united states couldn't have exactly. existed exactly Exactly. You know, uh, it, it's so it's it's just uh, tremendous. And when you say, you know, when we think about it, 100, I think about it all the darn time. It's all I think about. And, um, <laughs> and it's the same thing with you. Right. Yeah. As, uh, and we and we we often discuss um, on the show, you know, the not necessarily just we don't necessarily delve into all various conspiracy theories, but obviously we went through a better living through chemistry part of our human evolution here on the planet it was unavoidable um and uh and we've learned some valuable lessons and so hemp you can come right on back yeah i i want i wanted to ask you a couple quick questions just on some of the of the things uh that you had mentioned there and and one is I guess I, and it's so fascinating, you know, to learn about, because when you learn about how batteries work is and it's broken down for you, like, yeah, okay. It's actually more simple uh, than, than I thought. It's these components put together and it creates this reaction and that's how it gives, it, it gives a charge. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's pretty incredible uh, stuff, how simple it can be. And, and here you nearly, well, you're, an inventor and an intellectual and a, sci- a mad scientist. So uh, I won't say you stumbled upon the hemp creek battery that you were walking around Calgary with that day, that week. Um, but it's pretty amazing stuff. I wanted to ask you on when you discuss graphene, you discuss carbonized material. Uh, and I, I wanted to drill into that for a, a sec, Carl, um, because I am very much a proponent here in the United States as and, and you have the same issue in Canada where you must dispose of slash destroy crops that are not compliant. And in Canada, that's the same here in terms of anything that's above 0.3 percent delta nine tetrahydrocannabinol. Um, and I want pyrolysis uh, to become, and, and at the U.S. Hemp Authority, I'm sorry, the U.S. Hemp Roundtable this year, um, we have certainly uh, added that to our legislative agenda uh, for potential technical amendments to the Farm Bill. Um, but to allow pyrolysis to be a compliant way to dispose of hot hemp except that the materials produced therefrom may enter the stream of, of commerce. And when we talk about graphene and carbonized material, do you see hemp as being the source to the extent, of course, we need to get the, get the acres up, but hemp as being its own source of graphene and carbonized material to the, because it is, is such a, a great resource for, for those things or no? Absolutely. I, I, th- I think it's actually the best way of actually deposing of it because, listen, I'm a big proponent of, of carbonized uh, plant matter. I mean, I'll give you a couple of reasons why. I mean, we're, we're talking right now, governments are talking right now, 
right, of basically carbon sequestration. Well, guess what? I mean, carbon is, a, you know, when you carbonize plant matter, right, it's probably one of your greatest ways of, of, of solving this, you know, carbon sequestration. Look, you take the plant off the field. If you, let's look at a couple of examples. I put it into hempcrete. Hempcrete then builds your wall. That wall will last where? Decades, maybe a century. Okay. If you take it off the field and turn it into clothing, again, you're going to get maybe, you know, five to 10 years out of that fiber and then it's going to break back down. The food, you take it off, you eat it. Well, you know, it does its own thing. If you take this plant matter and you carbonize it, well, the really cool thing about this is we already have archaeological evidence to support this. I mean, they have earths that they've dug out of the ground out in the Amazon, same in Australia, and they're called terra preta or black earths, right? Yes. These black yes. earths, right, are the carbons that were left after, you know, they, they burned the material and they put it in the ground and helped to actually grow these early farms. Now, these dated back, they dated these carbons, you know, back 8,000 years. Well, that's serious carbon sequestration. You know, we're not talking about, you know, planting a tree, letting it grow 80 years, like some of them have actually talked about. We're talking about 8,000, not 80, 8,000 thousand years it's you know it's it's a great way of doing it and the thing is you know once you have this carbon right you can then create these these panels one of the now and i was talking about big ass earlier one of the things that really got me going on this was because down in, in australia okay they don't have a whole lot of hemp but they have a whole, where i was they have a whole lot of sugar cane and, you know people are looking at building houses out of out of hemp creek you know, they're bringing the hemp in from you know who knows where so i've heard some of them coming in from england and stuff like that it's like well there goes the carbon credits right out the window to build the house okay and i said you know you guys you can be using you know you can be using the sugar cane big ass to build your your houses you know the same thing as the hemp creek i was calling it cane creek you know and, and i was trying to explain to people i said look instead of taking your big gas and this is what they do actually down there to generate electricity and all over the world, you know, anywhere where you, you have sugar cane, they'll take the sugar cane and they burn it. And they come, what they do is combust it, right? So they just take it, put a match to it, and poof, you know, release all that energy from it. And, and as opposed to? As opposed to, you know, putting it into a controlled atmosphere where then you can actually create this essentially charcoal, right? But yes. that charcoal, now I try to get people to think about this for a second. So I'm just going to use kind of a, a number. And I'm just going to say, okay, say Say you took one kilo of this material, okay, and, and you combust it, and you get a thousand kilojoules of energy, right? So I'm just using a number just to keep things simple. So you get a thousand kilojoules of energy. Now, if you take the same plant, that same kilo, but you carbonize it, and you turn it into this panel, okay? Now this panel's, you know, is, is carbon. Is you know, we know it can remain stable for thousands of years. And now I know that if I put it you know, an electrolyte and put another piece of carbon beside it, I can actually create a supercapacitor or, you know, I can create a, a kind of a battery. Now I'm saying, okay, say you have the, the solar panels and the solar panels, they need, they need to store that energy. Otherwise you have to use it right away. All right. So we have these two carbon panels and we have solar and now carbon, we know lasts forever. Now we can, and, and oh, I should mention that supercapacitors have a theoretical um, charge cycle of basically a, a million. Okay. I don't think anybody's hit that yet, but that's the theoretical. And, and to put that in perspective again, if you look at a, a car battery, a car battery is something like 500 charge cycles. All right. So you got a car battery at 500, you've got the super fast, you have potentially a million. We got this carbon that can last a really long time. Now, going back to that point where I'm making combusting thousand kilojoules of energy. Now we have this carbon, create this battery. You have solar panels that charge and then the battery discharge, charge, discharge, charge, discharge. And for a million times how much more energy are you now getting out of that carbon versus you know just releasing it and combusting it and then releasing all that carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere you know so you did you tell me i mean i have never been able to calculate the number it's just this huge uh, funny number up in the space you know that's going to be but it's huge i mean it's going to be more than a thousand kilojoules of energy i mean you, you're using the sun to charge up this carbon and it releases that energy and it comes back again back and forth back and forth for the next hundred years well, it's not, it's, it's, it's no brainer to say, yeah, that's going to last a really long time. I'm going to get a lot more energy out of it. You know, it's a, 
That, that's we're talking what about we're talking about completely transforming yeah. and and eliminating our our need as technology advances, obviously, to use these these systems and, and forms of energy, our our reliance on fossil fuels. Period. Exactly. And, and you know, one of the reasons why I made it as a brick, right? Because when I was first doing some of this experimenting and whatnot, I was doing creating little things about the size of a stamp and then, you know, going. Wow, I put like 250 millil, milliamps onto this little thing, and then got me to thinking about surface area because I talk about surface area inside the battery. And I said, what about outside the battery? And it comes back to the hempcrete and be able to store it and put it as a brick. And I said, well, okay, if this brick is 4.5 volts, and the one that you saw, Joy, was about 4.5 volts because I designed it that way so it could actually charge a, <laughs> a tablet or a phone because it requires, it's the same as lithium, right? So 4.5 right. volts and about four or five amps. Now I said, start, if, if, if this is a wall of bricks on the outside of a building, start counting all those bricks. And okay, how many volts, how many amps could you store on the outside of that building? You know, that's surface area. So you could have huge surface areas, right? That basically you, you, you just charge and it holds your energy and where you go. We're using surface area uh, to our advantage now. It's not just, you know, a wall. It's a it's a wall that stores energy. It's you know there's a, there's it's a charging wall for heaven's yeah. sake. A charging wall. Exactly. Exactly. It's, Your it's tiny using... home, tiny homes. Exactly. Could, tiny homes can be batteries and tiny homes at the same time. Absolutely. You know, it's just using our surface area with the the, the materials that we have, right, to, uh, to in a more efficient way, right. So I mean, you know, we have solar panels and whatever, and that charges your house, you know, during the day. And then you can use that energy during the night, right? And so on and so forth. So, you know, and, and you can design it in a way so that, look, the solar panels will basically charge up that wall up. And then you have enough of those bricks that you can actually go, you know, three, four, five, seven days, okay, without having to recharge it again. So, you know, say it's, it gets pretty cold and dark in the wintertime in Canada, but, you know, Denmark has been doing uh, things like this for a while where, you know, they have solar panels and everything else. And they're, they're able to su survive. Although I heard down in Texas that they're all oh, their uh, windmill throws, but <laughs> that's a different story. <laughs> and we'll just hold a, a pin in that just for one sec as I insert sure. the fact that uh, tomorrow, because there's a new social media platform, I basically have zero time for social media, but there's a, a, a phenomenon of this clubhouse which is a new platform where you get to actually speak with each other so we instead of having all the weirdness of I, i'm misinterpreting everything that that person just posted or said you get to actually hear each other and talk and dialogue and some of the greatest minds in in our industry are, are have you know found this platform and are, are starting to to use it and tomorrow because i have some wonderful friends in texas we're gonna do a a whole hour clubhouse session on what would have happened in Texas had we had hempcrete and, right. and this conversation we're having right now is going to just so fantastically allow me to I mean bring it to the whole nother I was just going to talk about you know the retention of heat but now we're now you've reminded me with using the surface area and other technology being developed we're, who would have needed the power grid at all exactly I mean those windmills okay sure they could have froze up and they could freeze up for a few days but if you have you know, each and every house that was there to, you know, store that energy, when the thing do, did go down, you know, it's okay. We have bat, you know, a house battery that can actually then keep filling us the, filling that gap in regards to energy, right, that we're sorely lacking. So, I mean, they could have, yeah, charged up all those houses. Okay, the windmill goes off. Well, we got power for the next four days. We're okay. Guys get to work, get the mill mills fixed and, you know, back up and running. We wouldn't have this problem today if they would have had batteries or they would have had the hempcrete battery and breed houses that store the other energy, right? It's as simple as that. Attention cannabis podcast listeners. You can now listen to your favorite cannabis podcast ad free with the MJ Bulls mobile app. Just download the free MJ Bulls mobile app to your smartphone to start enjoying cannabis podcasts with no commercials. Go to Apple apps or Google play to get the MJ Bulls Cannabis Podcast app today. And in fact, thermal energy in terms of, and, and really that 
point of it alone, I thought was definitely worth the clubhouse. And, and that is, as you well know, due to the thermal capacity and fantastic way that that reconciles with the thermal conductivity. I mean, it is just the the most awesome you know, construction infill or wall insulation material you'd ever want to have. It is. It's an incredible building material. You could basically light a couple of candles, depending on how small the room is, um, yeah. you know, or use whatever power they had. Let's get the, the, the hemp battery out of it. And just the, the, the one hour on, one hour off. I, I actually work for a company that their headquarters is in Texas. It's an international company. And so all of the my coworkers, I'm sitting here in heaven in Seattle this week. And they're like, I'm sorry if our, you know, Zoom goes off. It just my, it means I'm out of power. I'm on an hour on, an hour off. So in any event... You know, to be able to use that hour of on power to warm up the house and then uh, and don't get it too hot, by the way, because it's going to retain that thermal energy so sure. well that you're going to get too hot very quickly and it will stay hot. Well, uh, so, yeah, it's already been know, shown. It's already been shown that, you know, the hempcrete houses will will actually, you know, save 90 percent of your energy costs, you know, by building with that material. So it's like it's almost a no brainer. It is a no-brainer. I mean, so much so that 12 to 18 inch thick wall, depending Mm -hmm. on how close you are to a pole or an equator, right, with good windows is going to give you, speaking on average, an interior ambient uh, temperature of about 60 degrees Fahrenheit year round without a heating or a cooling system. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, you look at you look at the Museum of London, where they actually, you know, did some of those calculations where they they, they needed 800 cubic meters or square meters of of space for their new uh, museum, and instead of going with a traditional mortar and brick, where they calculated they would need 20 kilowatts of energy to uh, basically, you know, heat and humidify and cool or whatever uh, this this building, you know, they calculated with hempcrete panels that they were going to be something like uh, five. Uh, kilowatts of energy and i think since it's been running it's only averaging about two kilowatts of energy so just think that's that's a huge savings and in, in regards to energy why i mean why why is it all, why are all canadian homes being built this way you know it makes it makes you kind of wonder you it makes you wonder and i love it. now we're telling you for everyone for the first time though despite the fact that we keep talking about calgary carl lives in canada so he's wondering <laughs> about the canadian homes um and we're we're gonna <laughs> whereas gonna mine get, is 20 you know <laughs> Yes, I and the other thing that I just want to mention, I, I basically want to piggyback off everything you say, and I just cannot wait to see you again so we can spend, you know, four or five hours together and I can get it all out and just listen to you and, and have a session. Um, but the other thing about the Museum of London, brother, why on top of the energy, it was about humidity regulation, That's hygroscopicity, right. and That's the right. fact that they have, and they're even, as you well know, uh, uh, creating mini hempcrete storage facilities within the the, museum because they are the ideal environment for incredibly valuable documents and artifacts because of hempcrete's unique ability to regulate humidity and vapor. Exactly. Well, look at the Adnan's brewery from the last time I I read anything about that. Adnan's was basically, you know, they've been able to maintain 13 degrees Celsius at 50% humidity all year round with no energy. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's incredible. It is incredible. And oh my God, see, I, now I have to say it again, because you had to mention that. Uh, and, and one of the many, and we've only scratched the surface, right, with the yeah. incredible things that they've discovered, but one that is particularly interesting um, that they did not even expect, it was just an unexpected, un, unanticipated benefit, is a quantifiable reduction in employee sick leave. Uh-huh. So whatever their building was prior to that, I mean, and it's possible it had sick building syndrome and there was something wrong with the building. But one thing they noticed for sure, once they were finished with this just tremendous uh, undertaking and transformation, this shining example of a brewery. Your, your, uh, walls, your walls essentially turn into the lungs of the building because it's, 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 yes. it's a breathable wall. Any kind of mold or bacteria that gets trapped in, in that wall because of its, there's a lime surface, an alkaline surface so that it basically nullifies and kills these things off so you know you get this beautiful clean air basically it's been filtered through that it's not like your walls are are literally you know wind passing through them or anything else it's just that they're breathable right it's a living breathing wall system 
a living, breathing wall system. And, and of course, on top of that uh, mold, rot, fire, and pest resistance yeah. uh, that hempcrete offers, of course, as we just discussing here, it also is offering you optimal indoor air quality, particularly if you would do a lime rendering. And, and then the other piece to that, and, and it just dovetails with our, with our earlier conversation here on carbon sink. I mean, between the hemp and the fact that the lime is wanting to become calcium, calcium carbonate, carbonate again. again, that's right. Starts, starts as calcium carbonate and goes back to calcium carbonate. And I love that chemistry. I mean, it's, it's incredible. You know, you got CaCO3, add a little bit of heat to it. Okay. You drive off the CO2, but then, you know, and so now you're left with CaO calcium oxide. And then over time, it, it takes back that carbon dioxide, you know, and it goes back to being rock again. So it's like, a, that's really cool. That line, and it fossilizes. So, and yeah. then, so your hemp home is only going to get stronger. I mean, exactly. yes, it, it, it requires timber or steel framing, although we're seeing some other cool types of framing. But yes, it is non-structural, except that it basically becomes monolithic eventually. <laughs> eventually, that's right. Absolutely. So it's a, it's a, it's a really cool material. Like it's just going to, yeah, it just gets stronger over time. So much so. And and two other quick things before we move on in our remaining time to talk a little bit more about you. Um, you're so wonderful. You would you would talk about batteries for this whole thing, but your oh, yeah. Carl Martel is so it is an explosion beyond batteries. Um, I I wanted to also uh, you had mentioned, of course, sugar cane and certainly having to deal with a carbon footprint of uh, of moving materials across the, the great oceans here. Um, and you may have met Stephen Clark. Clark. Have you ever met Stephen Clark of Mexico of having grown? Yeah, of course I have. Yeah, I've met him a couple of times. So yeah, he's he's great. He's wonderful. And just as you, you know, he's going to use what's local and available where yeah. he's at. And so he loves cocoa crete. And I'll you said always, cane crete. Yeah, I'll always promote local. You know, it's, it's like, you know, we get this agricultural waste that we have at our disposal. It's like it's going to be cheap, easy to use. And, you know, hey, if, it, if it's available, use it. You know, it's, if it's, it's a great available, way to use, use it. it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep. Greg Flaval and, and Andrea Herman of Hemp Technologies. You know, you often hear him say when he was in New Zealand, thank goodness we, we've got him in the United States now, but he was in New Zealand for all those years and there's a way more sheep than humans there. So, <laughs> so no, guys, we'll be using wool to insulate, you know, the, the ceiling. I, I hate to disappoint yeah. you. Recent, recent graduate from insert green school here who, who you know, wants all hemp, everything, and geothermal, even when there's no geothermal source. No, we're going to use what's local. So yeah. interesting stuff. Now, you, of course, uh, sit on multiple advisory boards and are just serve as a consultant and advisor to, to so many companies between American Harvest and, and Blue Sky Ventures and, and, and many others. And you're also involved uh, in a really fantastic, fascinating to me, um, company Ivona in, in Paraguay. Tell us, and, and I want you to be able to choose what, whatever it is that you're most excited about. Tell us about it, brother. Well, okay. Um, yeah, Evona and Healthy Grains. Uh, this group of guys, uh, you know, I was speaking in Uruguay back in, I can't remember when it was, you know, 2019, maybe it was before uh, the whole Corona thing. Uh, great group of guys. They're actually, so Healthy Grains is actually one of the largest producers of chia, you know, in, in the world. And chia, of course, is one of the other most great superfoods, right, that we everybody hears about. So uh, they, you know, and they can they're doing all that and they want to get into this. They heard about hemp and get into the other thing, into this other superfood. And Paraguay had just basically the guys and the president came out and said, with a national decree saying, you know, we're going to make uh, uh, industrial cannabis uh, a national priority and, and everything else that way. So a lot of really great government support here uh, in regards to uh, this plant and everything else. Out there. And I just love that. You know, when a government can, you know, step forward and say, yeah, we're going to give you everything you need. And, uh, you know, we're taking the red tape off, helping you guys out as, as best we can, you know, so you can get this stuff in going. They want to grow 50,000 hectares in this country. And uh, I'm like, that's the way to go. And, and, you know, it all start. it's all starting out with basically really, you know, food and fiber. And then you have, you know, your medicine along with it, you know, it, Look at some of these other countries. I, I feel for them. Uruguay, for example, kind of stuck in growing uh, just cannabis, you know, re recreational cannabis or medicinal cannabis. There's 70 percent of everything that they do there. And now they're saying, well, we want to get into the industrial side of things. But it's like you started off on the wrong foot. You know, it's like 
should be really focusing on getting your industrial cannabis sector going because that's a very stable. It may not be as glamorous as, as you know, the CBD thing and everything else, but it is it's the foundation necessary. Right. For it is the foundation that it provides the economic stability exactly. for the farmer and, and environmental stability. But exactly. continue, brother. It's the same thing in Canada. I mean, Canada, you know, they, they, did, they did some things right. I mean, they, they started off, they said, okay, you know, you can have rain and fiber, you can use that. You can't touch the flower right now. You know, 18 years later, they said, okay, now you can touch the flower. But it, it gave that foundation necessary to get this industry kind of off the ground, right? Colombia is another one. I think they're still kind of struggling, but, you know, they're, they're still kind of more focused on that drug side of things. And it's like, no, guys, look, food and fiber, right? Let's get going on it. Food, easy, get that going. You know, fiber, a little bit more uh, capital investment, everything else. And there are some struggles there, but uh, some struggling to get, to, you know, get that really that infrastructure up and running. But it, it's it's underway. I mean, and, and these guys here, you know, already growing basically a thousand hectares of uh, industrial cannabis. Uh, you know, they're also doing in the medicinal side of things. They have a grow here. They're permitted 0.5 percent level of THC in their crop. Well, Paraguay has a 0.5. And everybody, Carl, while he lives in, in Canada, he's visiting us today from Paraguay. So they so they can go up to 0.5 Delta 0.5. 9 there. And, and I think eventually they're going to go to that 1%, like a lot of other countries, like Switzerland, Colombia, Australia, uh, South Africa, I think, you know, a few others that have actually going that direction. It, it only makes sense. I mean, 0.3 for a long time has always been an arbitrary number. And I think uh, Governments and scientists scientists are recognizing that you know, zero point three is a bit ludicrous. We can we can we can be responsible with one percent. I think the Europeans might take a little bit longer to, to recognize that, but uh, they're gonna they're gonna get there eventually too. They've gone from zero point two to zero point three, so moving in the right direction. I think the United States too, they're going to go up to 0.5 very quickly. And as you may know, uh, and, and really, I think ideally, it's international leaders, we're wanting to sort of get together and, and do it as a as a as a real coalition coalitioned effort um as opposed to the one-offs because international trade obviously is so important here as well and so we we get into those issues of well europe if we went to one percent right now europe would consider our our plant material to be derived from other forms of cannabis to be derived essentially from marijuana, just to make it easy for our listeners, um, as opposed to hemp. So, you know, we'll be so excited, but you may know that the French parliament in a, in a just outrageously counterintuitive move just last week said, uh, oh, by the way, we think maybe 1% in the field. Like, you guys have been the holdouts on point two for all of these years. And now all of a sudden you're like, eh, 1% in the field. Now I think they did it to be provocative, but in any event, with, if we can get all of all of the international sort of federation going, and and as you may know, the idea of a, of an international hemp federation was really born in your home country of yeah. Canada, uh, the European Industrial Hemp Association (IA) and the Canadian Hemp Trade, Trade Alliance, Alliance with Ted yeah. Haney, and we had in fact the founding uh, meeting of the International Hemp Federation at that 2019 meeting yeah. uh, in Calgary, China, uh, Holland, Belgium, Australia. Uh, was there uh, two of us from the United States um, and some other countries as well and uh, so for us to be able to get together as a concerted effort and be like okay because to be able to say we're all making this push together and and having it done at the same time you know it certainly helps as these other countries do their do their one-off but it really needs to be a a, a wonderfully sort of timed and con concerted effort here, I think, to get it done right. And we're well on our way to that. We are well I, on our way to that. Absolutely. And, you know, you know, the, uh, the South Americans as well are the right on board with all this as well. They're, you know, they're coming together, creating these associations, wanting to come on board. They're coming on board internationally as well, you know, with these things. I mean, one of the greatest things I love about this government here, what they said was, okay, we want to grow to 50,000 hectares. But we want this to help our small farmers. Our small farmers are all redistributed uh, plots. They're all uh, basically two hectare plots. We want them growing, okay, on two hectare plots to basically uh, um, uh, crop rotation with their sesame and other things that way that they that they're you know they're generating some income. But the hemp will provide even more income, right, for these small farmers, right. So that's the idea. If, you know, these twenty five thousand small farms. All having, you know, the, this, this hemp to be able to grow in rotation with their crop to, to increase the money for this small farmer, right? And the poor farmer, right? It's trying to raise the level of 
uh, um, the, 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 their living wage and their living styles, everything else, right? So that they're able to then their quality of life, country, their quality of life. I mean, this country, you know, you think people don't hear about Paraguay. They go, Paraguay, where the heck is that? You know, it's like, you know, somebody show them, I pull the map, and say, see South America here, look right in the middle, <laughs> see that country right there, that's Paraguay. You know, uh, people don't think of it as a, a whole lot, but it's like it, it's a really good country. It's it's moving up there. I wouldn't consider them a third world country. Actually, I've been living here. I'm going through these sort of malls and everything else. And I'm seeing this country growing like crazy, you know, and um, <clears throat> they're very progressive in their thinking. You know, it's a very young population here as well. Very open. Uh, a lot of these things, like I say, makes a whole lot of sense. And that's one that's one of the really main reasons why I'm down here, you know, is, is this, you know, this welcoming of the government, the welcoming of this of the, of these people, and the, the, the companies that I'm working with, um, they're very accepting of these new ideas, very progressive in the way that they're thinking and everything else. And I think that's that's great. And I mean, that's going to really help the industry, I think, without having, you know, government hindrances being put in and, and their government meddling, really. That's the, the red tape, bureaucratic tape to, to see about all this. It's like, come on, guys, just get out of the way you know, so I can get things done. You are you are a kid in a candy store there. I mean, <laughs> I, you are a kid in a candy store there. And I'm just, I'm so jealous between, you know, the pictures that you shared with me and the fact that you're like being welcomed with open arms by the people, by the government, by the, right. by the folks. With, with infrastructure, it is a dream for uh, a hemp revolutionary or renaissance man like yourself, yes. Carl. They're so lucky to have you. I, I can't wait to get down there myself at some point. And, Come on down anytime. And I, oh, gosh. And uh, I, I just I cannot wait to be able to commune with everyone, but especially incredible souls like you. You're, you're, uh, you just shine so bright. Thank and you very Oh, cannot wait to see all that all that you're doing and, and to see it all come true in the world. Um, and so much of it already has. We've really only scratched the surface of Carl Martell, which means um, that I'm going to have to have you back, brother. <laughs> Anytime, Joy. I'd love to. Yay. Uh, I can't wait to do it. I am wishing you good health, good fun, so much prosperity, and just uh, continue to, to walk in your purpose. Um, and may it be just rewarding. And, and filled with joy while you're down there and afterwards, Carl. We'll have you back on again soon, brother. Well, thank you very much. 